microphone okay there? So Jeremiah chapter 11. Good morning on this last Lord's Day of the Year. 2013 is nearly finished. Let's come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord, we come before you as our Father and our God. We recognise that all that we have all that we are, Lord, comes from you. We thank you for this past year, for, for lessons learnt, for sins forgiven, for help given, Lord, for, um, for the way that you've lifted us up and kept us. We thank you that we are indeed kept by the power of God through faith. And, and as we come to your word this morning, uh, we are conscious that um, as, as frail, uh, as mortal uh, men and women, uh, we, we don't have the capacity or the wherewithal to, to respond or to understand or even to hear your call, except you be gracious unto us. We pray that you'd open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law, that the understanding that uh, you promised by your Holy Spirit would, would be our experience this morning as, as we respond in faith to the very words of God. And we, we thank you for your presence, Lord. We pray that that presence would be manifest and that in each heart this morning, um, whatever the, the need... Uh, whatever the cry, whether there's uh, joy or tears, we thank you that you're a God who uh, meets us where we are and ministers to that need. So, Lord, uh, we, we do pray that you would undertake for us and we just thank you, Lord, for all your workings and your love and your goodness and your greatness toward us. So we bring these things before you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we've, um, chapter 11, about a fifth of the way through. Long way to go in Jeremiah. Um, last time we, we spoke, uh, we started to touch on why it was that God was so... Um, concerned and so uh, grieved about the way that Israel and Judah in particular had uh, rejected him and had taken up to idols and this young prophet had been called by God to bring a message that was a very unpalatable message, uh, a message that uh, he had been told by the Lord that they would not receive and even so, they, they were, uh, he was told that he was to proclaim that message that they would not receive, and it was a message of condemnation. It was a message of judgment that was coming to these people who had persistently and consistently, over many, many hundreds of years, rejected God. And the reason we saw, we had a touch of it, the reason we saw that God was so grieved was that God was concerned about a relationship with himself. I don't know how you think about the Christian life. For some of us, we sometimes think about the Christian life as a series of things that we have to do or things that we should not do or words we should say or shouldn't say or ways we should behave. And yet, that's really not the Christian life at all. The Christian life is about a relationship of a man or a woman with God. And God was so concerned with that relationship that right in the Garden of Eden, he 
created man and woman and he created them to walk with him, to have fellowship with him. And when man rejected God, it wasn't just about rejecting a commandment. It was about rejecting a person. It was like a man and a woman who are married, who have a heart and a love for one another, and then one of those people turns against and rejects that spouse. And we see it every day, don't we, in our world that we live, and it creates heartache, it creates brokenness, it creates sorrow. And so God, having created man for that relationship, man rejected God. But God doesn't change, and we're going to see that. God doesn't change, so when God started to bring judgment and death, it wasn't because he wanted to harm and hurt, because God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And even when he destroyed the world under Noah, it wasn't that he was going to love to see men and women destroyed. It was because they had come to a place where there was no possible alternative. There was no way that man could be woken up other than judgment. And so it is in the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is like a case study for our walk with God. It really is. It's like a case study of how God deals with his people and how we as his people can respond to him. And Israel and Judah had so rejected God and we read in chapter 2 of Jeremiah that they had forsaken him, the fount of living waters, and they had hewn out cisterns of their own making. And they had sought after gods, other gods. And he described it like the man-woman relationship, like the marriage relationship. It was as if these people who, in whom God was in love had chosen to chase after others, to chase after harlots, he said, to sever that relationship. And yet God called them. He called them by prophets and he, he pled with them. Imagine God, the creator of heaven and earth, pleading with a man. We see a little picture of it, don't we, sometimes in our world. It's only a faint glimpse when a, a parent may plead with a child. And here is God, our maker, pleading with Israel. We even see glimpses in Jeremiah how he, he sought he sought them out, but they were not willing. They were not willing. And they created these systems and they followed after other gods. They committed idolatry and this led to their decline and deterioration as a nation into immorality and all kinds of abhorrent practices, even to the sacrifice of their own children before these new gods. That's where they had come. And so we're in, in chapter 11. We're still in the middle of, of a section of the book where um, Jeremiah is bringing these prophetic utterances against Israel. And that goes right through to pro uh, probably, um, oh, I think, uh, chapter 20. So we're kind of in the middle of that as far as the book's concerned. And Jeremiah now uh, brings from the Lord, I guess, a perspective, a view of that relationship in terms of the covenant that God had with his people. And we read about it in chapter 11, uh, in verse 6, the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant and do them. And I earnestly protested, verse 7, unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up, out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. And he, you obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one 
in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. God had established a covenant, a, a, an agreement. It was part of the relationship. Now, he had established several covenants. There were several agreements that God made with man. It's staggering to think that God would make an agreement with man. He established a covenant with Noah. Remember when he destroyed the world and he made a covenant and he set a bow in the sky. And he said, never again will I judge the world in this way and destroy it by water. That was a covenant. It was an agreement. The thing about God's part of the covenant is that you could trust that part. God hasn't failed his part. But he, he was concerned about relationship and so he made this agreement. His covenant. He wanted Noah to know certain things. And he was going to expect that they responded to him. Just like a marriage relationship. Just like a marriage relationship. Love begetting love. And then he established a covenant, an agreement with Abraham. And we today are the beneficiaries of that. Because he had promised that in Abraham, in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And in that seed who was Christ, ultimately, we can know the blessing of life and hope and forgiveness and eternity and heaven. Redemption and forgiveness of sin. That was an agreement he made with Abraham. And then he made an agreement with by Moses and this is the covenant that he's referring to here it was an agreement with the people he, he told them and he reaffirmed it in the end of Deuteronomy he said that um, he would set before these people life and death blessing and cursing and you don't need too much sense do you to think about which one you'd want to choose, wouldn't you? God said, you, and he pleaded with his people. Again, choose life. Choose life. But this covenant had, I guess, two parts to it. There was God's part and there was man's part. And man's part was, if you obey me, if you trust me, if you're prepared to honour and, and submit to my authority and recognise that I do know more than you and recognise that I am greater and I've got a greater insight and a greater wisdom and to recognise that these words, these commandments that I'm setting before you are for your good and for your blessing. If you will but recognise that and submit to it, and obey me, you will experience all the blessings of life. And you will have life. The other side of the covenant was that if you disobey me, if you do what we read here, walk everyone in the imagination of their evil heart, if you trust to yourself and not to God, if you choose your own inclinations and judgments, if you place your authority and if you consider your insight as above God's, then you will reap the curse. You will reap death. And so it has always been, for the wages of sin is death. And these people would come, and that happened 800 years before this time when he reaffirmed that covenant. And he, it's not as if God sort of had a look, you know, five minutes effort, no, <laughs> not going to work. He gave them centuries, centuries, centuries. And he called them and they strayed, and he called them and they strayed. And yet, 
because of the sin and the evil and the wickedness of our hearts, of all of us, because of the flesh, our sinful inclination, even though there was life and even though there was blessing on this side and there was death and there was cursing on this side, guess which one we chose? Well, we should say, guess which one the nation chose? They chose death. They chose death. And every time man turns in pride against God, that's the choice. That's the choice we make. We can choose, it seems... God has given us some degree of autonomy to say yes or no to his face. But we can't choose the consequence. And this nation was now facing, oh, I don't know whether this happened on the the turn of the new year, but they were facing in the years ahead a devastation such as was not known. It had been foretold in Deuteronomy, that this would happen. And now it was on the eve of happening. You know, your families destroyed. Babylon coming in as a, as a, a, a cruel, as a heartless army. No mercy to men or women or children. And you read some of the, the passages on that and it's it's. R-rated material. It's, it's horrendous. It's frightening. And yet such was man's stubbornness that God had come to this. Was he surprised when God gave this covenant to, to Moses? Was he now surprised? Oh, this is the remarkable this is the remarkable thing about the grace of God, you know. Even as he gave the covenant eight hundred years before, he knew the choice. He knew. He knew as they told them that they would turn their back on him, and yet he continued to love them with an everlasting love. So where does it leave these people? They had broke, we read about the break in the covenant, and in verse 15, and, and in fact, in verse 14, he said to Jeremiah, you Don't pray for these people's deliverance. You know, sometimes we, we pray for people's deliverance, don't we? So they're not going to get delivered from this. It's not going to happen. Oh. And Jeremiah wept over this. We, he, he was grieved. As a, as, a, as a young man of God that this was going to happen and yet it was going to happen. Remember, to put this into perspective, it wasn't just that these people had rejected God. It wasn't just that. It was they had come to a point, and this, is, this seems staggering to me, they'd come to a point where not only had they rejected him, but they they couldn't even see that they had sinned. In Jeremiah chapter 2, they said, I am innocent. I have not sinned. So God had been calling them. They had fallen so far. And he even, even then he gave them a, 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 a pleading to, to turn back. You backsliding children. Just, just recognise Recognise, acknowledge your iniquity. Not only did they say we're not going to acknowledge our iniquity, they said, what iniquity? What's the big deal? You know, it's like a, a, a man and a woman married in a loving and intimate relationship and then the man going off with other women and then coming to his wife and saying, what's the problem? I spend most of my time with you. This is what it was like. 
So when we read that God brought these judgments, we need to understand that God, as a righteous God, never, never stops being a gracious and a loving God. And when he brought these judgments, he brought them in love to a prodigal people. And there was no other way to wake them up. They had so declined that they couldn't even see, they wouldn't even acknowledge that they were in the wrong. And God knew. And God knew. And evil was going to come in verse 15. What has my beloved to do in my house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many? You see, it's, bringing, it's, it's comparing it to the marriage relationship, really. Again, and, and, and the holy flesh is passed from thee. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoices. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. Remember the, the anger because of the idolatry and the Baal was because it, it broke the heart of the relationship. Exactly the same as you would see when a marriage relationship is broken and one person's unfaithful. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And so God was going to judge them. And uh, verses 18 uh, there, it talks about... The first time it talks about a plot against Jeremiah's life. We're not going to go into that at the moment. But remember, Jeremiah was bringing this message... He's bringing it to a people who don't even recognise that they've done anything wrong. And what's going to be the response? Well, their response was, we've got to get rid of this guy. You know, he's stirring up trouble. Uh, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not listening to anybody else. And he just brings on this, this call of judgement. Continual call of judgement. And then chapter 12, and again we're not going to look at that, in detail, chapter 12, he, he talks more about the consequence, the judgment, God forsaking his people. But then there's a touch, if you like, in verse 14 of chapter 12. See, God's purpose, if you look at his grand purpose, it's a, it's a purpose of restoration and redemption. Right from the fall in the Garden of Eden, God was concerned to, to bring back that relationship. Remember we said at the beginning it was a relationship. The covenant was a relational covenant. That was the heart of the covenant. It wasn't just about the laws and the things. It was about a relationship of man with God. And, and, and here he says in verse 14... Thus says the Lord against all my evil neighbours that touch the inheritance which I have caused. You know, I guess Babylon could have thought, oh, great, you know, I'm on the right side of God here. <laughs> Helping God out by, this, by punishing this people. No, 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 no. God is saying, those that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. It shall come to pass after that I have plucked them out I will return and have compassion on them and will bring them again, every man to his heritage and every man to his land. And it goes on. A number of times when he, earlier on in the book, uh, when he talks about the judgment and that he will destroy and bring judgment, he's, he will not make a full end, he says. I'm not going to completely destroy this nation. You see, these are my people... My purpose is not destruction. My purpose is to renew that relationship. So, let's think about it for a moment. God established a covenant, an agreement. And it failed. 
Did God not know what he was doing? He knew these people would sin. He knew they would fail. He knew he would be faithful. It's hard to fathom, isn't it? This covenant for these nearly a thousand years where man had the opportunity to submit himself to God, had the opportunity to respond to the goodness and the love of God exactly as in our lives that failed. And God knew it would. So we're left hopeless and helpless, aren't we? Not quite. (laughs) There is a new covenant, and I want to finish off at the, the eve of the new year talking about the new covenant. Because as we go through Jeremiah, we're going to get back to more of the judgments, more of what's happening. But, you know, if we go forward a little bit, if we, if we get to uh, chapter 31, and sort of we'll, we'll go towards that again eventually, but, but let's just look forward a little bit. Because, you see, it's easy to become despondent, isn't it? <laughs> it's easy to think, well, I mean, we might as well give up. I mean, the children of Israel couldn't obey God. The children of Israel couldn't be faithful. The children of Israel would not recognise and respond to his love as they ought. They wouldn't. It's a failure. And so, you know, why not just give up? But scattered throughout Jeremiah, and particularly in the 30, 31, 32, there's a, there's a forward look, even beyond Babylon, well beyond Babylon. And he wants the people to understand, look, um, I'm, I'm the Lord of heaven and earth, and this hasn't slipped through my fingers. I know what I'm doing, and there's something wonderful, there's something beautiful on the horizon, beyond all imagination. And here is, the, here is the touch in chapter 31. Verse 31, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now, to understand that covenant, we've got to go forward. We've got to go to the book of Hebrews. And this is where we're going to end, probably, in the book of Hebrews. If we go to Hebrews chapter 8, we have an old covenant. We have this Mosaic covenant, this covenant based upon the response of the children of Israel to God's call and to God's um, uh, demand, if you like, that they trust him and obey him and submit to him. And that didn't work. And it can't work for us because of our sin and our evil heart. And now we come to this new covenant. And this covenant in Jeremiah 31 is elaborated here. In fact, all through the book of Hebrews, um, the, the, uh, the writer is going back to things that God had established, God doesn't change, and showing how those things were a shadow, were a picture. They weren't the reality. The sacrifices were a shadow of the true Lamb of God. The tabernacle was just a shadow of a picture of the presence of God dwelling in his people. The forgiveness, the atonement 
the covering of sin for the blood of the lamb was just a picture. It was a shadow. It wasn't the reality. You could almost say the old covenant was like a, like a shadow. He, goes on, he says this, and these are very strong words. He says in verse 7, we haven't got time to look at all of this, if the first covenant had been faultless, now that, this is not saying that the first covenant that God had made a mistake. It's not saying there was a problem with the covenant. It wasn't a problem with the covenant. There was a problem with the people. Right? There wasn't a problem with the law. God says the law was good in Romans. The law was good. It was, it was the sinfulness of sin that was bad. And, and this covenant had fault in the sense that it had failed to bring together relationally man with God. It had failed. God knew that would, would fail, but we didn't. And God wanted people, and I don't know all the reasons he did things the way he did, but he, he wanted people to see the, the depravity of the heart. That all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That even with all the goodness of God, man will still rebel and turn his face upon loving God. So much so that at the cross... They would turn their anger and their bitterness and their hatred against the very Son of God. And so this covenant had, had it not it hadn't been faultless, had it accomplished what it 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 it, it was what, <laughs> intended to accomplish, not intended in the sense that God God knew it wouldn't accomplish it, but had it accomplished that relationship, that restoration then there would no place have been sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come. Now he's got, just remember what we read in Jeremiah, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Right. Almost the same word, That's, it's referring to that passage in 31 of Jeremiah. And he says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. We have the Old Testament and an old covenant. We have a new testament and a new covenant. The old had fault in the sense that it could never, it could never bring man into relationship with God. Why? Not because the law was bad, not because God had failed, but because of the sinfulness and depravity of us. That's you and me today. So every time we determine or decide or think that somehow I can gain favour with God and I can bring back the broken pieces and I can somehow restore myself with the Lord. I'm just reenacting the old covenant. I'm just reenacting the failure. Because I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. And so, wonder of wonders, God has established a new covenant, a new agreement, and a new relationship. And that relationship is based upon a saviour. 
and the one we remembered before. God incarnate. God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. Jesus Christ, creator of heaven and earth, who took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. God humbled himself. That's, it's such a tale of love, of goodness, that with all our rebellion and our hatred toward God, that he would take a step that would cost him beyond anything. That he would give his only begotten son. So that he could establish a new covenant. A new relationship. I don't know how it works. I don't even know how it worked with me. But I do know that it's true. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that salvation is, is not something that we've accomplished. And it's not dependent upon me. It's a drowning man <laughs> crying out for help. And God rescues him. And he does that. Now how he had to do that is, 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 is hard to understand. There's a depth to that. He had to somehow deal with the sin. He had to pay, he had to bear in his own body on the tree the sins of the world. All those rebellions. He had to deal with that somehow. How did he do that? I don't know. But he did it. He's God. He loved us even while we were yet sinners. You see, this is at the heart of the new covenant. It's a new relationship. If anyone here has a, a, a walk with God in inverted commas based on your performance, based on how you're going to get it right, it, it'll fail. It fails all the time. See, we, we, don't have any, we don't have control over ourselves. We don't have control over other people. We don't have control over God. We're impotent. We're impotent. We're not sufficient. Paul put it this way, that we are not sufficient in ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency is of God. And so how does a person enter into the new covenant? I don't know your heart, but it's by faith. And herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What's faith? It's not a work. Faith is an acknowledgement and a trust that God is God. It's seeing because of what he's given us. It's seeing something of his love on the tree. It's seeing something of his concern for me personally. He's interested, I don't know how it can be in the billions that he's interested in the individual, but God is God. He's interested in correcting and directing and redirecting our lives. And sometimes he brings suffering and pain and difficulty. Just as it happened to these people in Jeremiah's day, because he, he knows we've got to wake up a little. But he does it ever so lovingly. He does it as a father for his children. Even when he chastises it, it says uh, a little later in, in the book of Hebrews, he does it as a loving father. He, he wants to get us back. He knows where we are. 
He wants to conform us to the image of his dear son. He wants us to be Christ-like, to be like Jesus. So where does it leave us today, the eve of 2014? Where do you want your life and your heart to be? It doesn't matter whether you're younger, whether you're middle age, whether you're older. (laughs) God is working his work. He's established the new covenant. It's all done. It's finished on the tree. (laughs) It doesn't have to be repeated. Wouldn't it be good to respond to him in praise and in thanks and maybe even acknowledge to him that some of the things you haven't liked about 2013 and don't like about the way he's dealing with things, that maybe it would be good to acknowledge to him, Lord, you're right. I I can't quite see it, I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust you. Because you first loved me and gave yourself for me, I can can trust you. I will. By his grace. So, from a, a period of suffering and trial and impending disaster looking out through the corridors of history to the cross and the resurrection and the glorification and the coming again of him who is our blessed hope there's no reason why we should we we may go into 2014 facing all sorts of difficulties and I'm sure many of us will But there's no reason to go into that year hopeless. Maybe for some of us we have to let go of some things. Maybe there have been some things we've been trying to orchestrate and make and do that we can't. Maybe we need to trust that God will do it. And ask him. And then trust him that in his time and his way, just as he accomplished in the sweep of history, established the new covenant and has redeemed man to himself, that he can deal with those things. And we can respond in the worship that is his due. And we won't worship him now quite as we will is in the book of Revelation. But we can learn, we can begin to worship him and thank him and honour him and glorify him as not only the God who is able, but the God who deserves and should have our honour and worship and response and love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that um, we do not live as others who have no hope. May it inspire us and lift us, Lord, to, to open our eyes to the fields that are white to harvest. And, and Lord, we know each of us, for, for each one here, there, there are going to be times in this coming year of of joy and triumph and times of of failure and suffering and sorrow. We thank you that as a loving Father, we can learn to trust you in the midst of all of those things. To look again, whenever we doubt, to one hanging on a tree who gave his all and accomplished what nothing else could do no other lamb, no other sacrifice but the perfect lamb of God and Lord help us to know you more to understand something more of God to walk with him maybe to make some choices where we take time to be holy and take time to be with Jesus and so we would just ask that you would have your own way We thank you that you're a a God 
who is um, beyond um, wonder and we just want to learn to honour you with our, our lips and our hearts and all that we have and to follow you uh, not as those trying to gain favour but as those who want to please God out of a heart of love, out of a response of, of love to uh, God who has done all that could possibly be done for a fallen people. And so we rejoice this morning at uh, the, the privilege and the opportunity to, to get a glimpse of just who you are and we just pray that this, the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts, even as we go forward in the day, would be acceptable in thy sight, our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.